Good evening, everyone. My name is Bhagwan Chaudhary. I'm a professor of finance at uh, UCLA Anderson and faculty director of Impact at Anderson. I'd like to thank the Academy and the Hollywood Foreign Trust. No, sorry. That's a, that's a wrong speech, okay. On behalf of Anderson students, faculty, staff, and alumni, I'd like to welcome you this evening. We are here to join a very important Architects of Change conversation with Maria Schreiber. These conversations feature conscious idealists, people who challenge what is, people who open hearts and minds, people who speak up, act, and ignite change in the world. Tonight's conversation with actress and writer Seth and Lauren Rogan, the founders of Hilarity for Clarity, Charity, is about a crisis, a health crisis, a societal crisis, a family crisis called Alzheimer's. Let me see, how many of you know or care for a person who has Alzheimer's? Let me see a show of hands. There you go. A few years ago, I read a novel called Still Alice by Lisa Genova. Many of you know that it was made into a motion picture in 2014 with Julianne Moore, who was nominated for Oscar for Best Actor. She plays a professor in mid-50s who begins to forget things. Now, I know a professor in mid-50s who's beginning to forget. Uh, the story really touched me. But I was scared. My wife, Swati, refused to read the book or watch the film. But she's sitting here today. Because tonight's conversation will be about more than the tragedy of Alzheimer's. It will be about love and about hope. And let me assure you, there will be some laughter as well. Now, some of you may wonder, why a School of Management is hosting an event like this? Our mantra here is simple. Make a difference. For all of us at UCLA Anderson, it's not a choice. It's a moral imperative. We challenge ourselves at UCLA Anderson to think in the next, to take an approach to business and social enterprise that will help solve the most challenging social issues of today and tomorrow. Our students, many of them are here today, are more passionate than ever I have seen to apply their professional expertise to achieve impact. Many of them define success by impact. In short, we are preparing the next generation of architects of change. So we share a common purpose this evening with a very special guest and with all of you. I want to show you a quick video that tells us a little more about the incredible work Seth and Lauren Rogan are doing with Hilarity for Charity. Uh, can we have the video? <laughs> Now, at this point, my impression of Alzheimer's was probably what I assume most people's impression is. I thought it was something only, like, really, really old people got, and I thought the way the disease primarily showed itself was in the form of forgotten keys, wearing mismatched shoes, and being asked the same question over and over. After that, however, is when I saw the real ugly truth of the disease. After forgetting who she and her loved ones were, my mother-in-law, a teacher for 35 years, then forgot how to speak, feed herself, dress herself, and go to the bathroom herself, all by the age of 60. As you've heard, unlike any of the other top 10 causes of death in America, there is no way to prevent, cure, or even slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Another thing I didn't realize until I was personally affected was the shame and stigma associated with the disease. 
And it's because of this lack of hope and shameful stigma that my wife, some friends, and myself decided to actually try and do something to change the situation. We started Hilarity for Charity. Hilarity for Charity is a fund we have as a part of the Alzheimer's Association to raise money to help families struggling with Alzheimer's and support cutting-edge research. People need more help. Studies show that Alzheimer's and related dementia is the most costly condition in the United States. Yes, it's more costly than heart disease in a country where for $1.29 you can get a taco made out of Doritos. But deaths from other major diseases like heart disease, HIV, and strokes continue to decline. Deaths from Alzheimer's have increased almost 70% in the last 15 years. Over 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's, and at this rate, in 35 years, as many as 16 million will have the disease. So few people share their personal story, so few people have something to relate to. Americans whisper the word Alzheimer's because their government whispers the word Alzheimer's. And although a whisper is better than the silence that the Alzheimer's community has been facing for decades, it's still not enough. It needs to be yelled and screamed to the point that it finally gets the attention and the funding that it deserves and needs. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the force behind the Architects of Change conversation series, a mother, daughter, sister, a journalist, producer, author, anchor, a champion, and an inspiration. Please join me in welcoming Maria Shriver. Please give a big welcome to Seth and Lauren Rogan. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you for showing uh, Seth and Lauren's film. And thank all of you for coming here tonight uh, to this Architect of Change conversation with uh, two people who are indeed making change uh, across the globe. So thank you for coming. Uh, many of the people that came and bought tickets here signed uh, commitments uh, that they would become architects have changed themselves, see themselves as empowered people, not bystanders. They would engage in open and non-judgmental uh, conversations, and they would agree to vote. And uh, uh, even though our primary is way too late, but uh, <laughs> that's a different story. But uh, so welcome, and thank you for coming. And uh, when we talk about architects of change, we talk about people who challenge what is, imagine something better, and then go about and build it. And Seth and Lauren have done just that. Faced with a personal situation, Lauren's mom, as you heard, diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Instead of uh, going into a room and shutting the door and becoming inactive, they, I assume, talked amongst each other, imagined what they could do, and then they went out and built Hilarity for Charity, which is having tremendous success spreading awareness about Alzheimer's, supporting caregivers, and also funding research. And they're doing this by targeting millennials. And that's, I guess, you. It's not me. It's you young people out there. So thank them. Congratulations for what you guys have done. And uh, Lauren, begin by saying, where did the idea for hilarity come? Because you don't normally think of hilarity and Alzheimer's in the same sentence. Well, I, just to correct, I did spend a few years dark in a dark room being really sad. Right. Um, and, um, and then, but that's not who we are. And it didn't feel good and it didn't feel right and I felt very alone and dark. Um, and a friend of ours, Matthew Bass, who was drawn into that video you just saw, um, came to us, I guess, about four and a half years ago and said, I want to do a variety show um, and I want it to be for charity and let's raise money for Alzheimer's. And... This wasn't super foreign to us because we work in comedy and it felt very, I mean, daunting, no doubt, but at the same time felt very natural to us. If we were going to do something, it made sense to do that, to, to do something in comedy. And even though comedy and Alzheimer's aren't really a, a natural fit, per se, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a true believer in that sometimes something is so sad, you just have to laugh. Right. And uh, there are many 
beautiful, sad stories and beautiful events that are very classy and, and very sincere. And we wanted to sort of break up that space a little bit with, and be a little bit louder, a little bit raunchy, and, you know, really make some noise to really get attention. If, you know, you're focusing on millennials, you got to step outside the box a bit. Why did you want to focus on millennials? Um, because I, I guess I was one. I don't know what the age <laughs> limit is. I don't know if I am anymore, which is so sad. Um, <laughs> but at the time, I was. We had I just was, been millennials. We were just millennials. <laughs> <laughs> um, Recently, not millennials, yeah. but yeah, pretending to be millennials. Um, but um, I, I was very young. I was I was 25 when my mom was diagnosed. Um, I was a few younger than that when I noticed things, and so I felt I felt pretty alone. I felt you know uh, like no one else my age was going through it, even though I knew that, but no one was talking about it. And I would say something to a friend and, and tell them my story, and they were just sort of clueless about it and didn't really know. And that didn't seem right. I knew there were people out there. And then once we started talking about it, once he started talking about it, because people were like, what's this guy doing talking about Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. um, people started contacting us, which was so amazing. And I was like, oh, I'm not alone. There are so many people out there who want a voice. They want to share their story. They want to take action. And so it became a very... I don't know, it was, it was, we were very lucky. It was sort of an or organic growth that happened because I think there was a need for it. People wanted to yell and scream about it in the way that we do. You, um, you talk in the film, Seth, about thinking that Alzheimer's was something. You said people wore mismatched shoes and something that happened only to old people. Many people think, oh, Alzheimer's is a natural part of aging, which it isn't. What have you, what surprised you the most about Alzheimer's before uh, you came face to face with it? Um, a lot of the stuff I say in the video that uh, I didn't realize there was no treatment in any way, shape, or form that like if you go to a doctor, they will say that there is nothing at all they can tell you that will do anything to in any way slow the progression of it. At all, Any, anything that works, at least. Exactly. So, so that was thing. that was surprising to me. Um, I didn't realize that it was also the most expensive disease in America, uh, as far as the overall cost to people and to the government, mm -hmm. and and those two facts are honestly the, the the fact that those two things coexisted is what surprised me the most. That that America, such a capitalist country, would allow <laughs> their most expensive disease to go completely unchecked in any way, shape, or form. Because I just thought from a monetary level that was insane. Nonetheless, from like the emotional level of just having no way to stop the disease, I thought it just seems weird that the most expensive disease has no way of being stopped. And, um, that to me was shocking because I thought even like if you suck every ounce of emotion out of the situation, as the government likes to do, it still seemed like there was a problem that would be very, uh, e you know, that one would be very eager to address, which is we have something that's costing us money and no way to stop it, you billions know? Billions and billions of dollars. Now, yeah. you testified in the Congress. I also did that a couple years before you, but yours made a lot of um, news because uh, t talk us through this. He went to testify and nobody really showed no up. No one showed up. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of Pineapple Express fans in Congress, uh, shockingly. But, but it was like maybe, a really maybe that'll deal change. that you came to testify and then like nobody showed up. I think they didn't. There's a seat of like, there's a room with 16 chairs and two of them were filled. I know. If they, someone should have told them like, if no one's going to show up, take their chair away because it makes it much more obvious that they're not there. Like, you, when you see, like, 20 empty chairs and two people, like, I don't know that much about the Congress. I, if there was just two chairs, I would have assumed only two people were supposed to be there. But The craziest thing was that they told us that that was normal. And that was that even crazier. Like, like yeah. no wonder nothing happens with the government. Only two people show up to yeah. the hearings. And, and, but yeah. you called them out on it. Yeah, well, so I don't think yeah. they understood social media that well. Because a lot of them actually... Uh, What's funny is several of them showed up in a small room beforehand and took pictures with me. And then they didn't bother coming to the thing. And they tweeted out the pictures and stuff. And so I tweeted at them, like, you didn't come to the thing. Like, 
<laughs> and then we and then I tweeted pictures of all the empty chairs. Being like, where is everybody? Like, I flew to DC. Like, what happened? And then. And and so that seemed to upset people, I think, because I don't think the average person like me knew that the government could just not show up for work. Um, and so I think that got more attention than anything in a lot of ways was uh, the epiphany that you could just literally not show up if you're uh, if it's your job to show up for something. And so that was kind of nice, I guess, that it made people as angry as us, but... And, and then, but, but honestly, what was even more appalling is there was a senator there who had Alzheimer's, who was testifying, and these people knew him. And it's very rare to get someone with Alzheimer's to speak out publicly in any way, shape, or form. It's something you just don't see that often at all. And this guy, after of all the years we've been doing this, he's one of like the maybe two or three people I've seen publicly speak with Alzheimer's, and they didn't even show for him. And I thought that was really crazy. And so, again, but again, if anything, you were just like, this is why nothing happens, like, because no one shows up. But you did, that was, it got a lot of news, you're right, about, yeah. uh, you know, you, how you handled it on social media. But now, it, with Hilarity for Charity, you really are focusing on supporting millennials. And I think a lot of people don't think that millennials are involved in caregiving, are struggling with Alzheimer's. So what, are the, what do you think you're doing for millennials that nobody else was reaching out to do? Well, I guess for me personally, um, I just, like I said, I felt very alone. And so um, a few years into my process, I found a support group for um, people under 40. And it was, it was a fantastic way to, I finally was like, oh my God, you get it. And to be understood, especially in a situation like this, is, is amazing and made me feel so, so good, and so much less helpless. And, um, and so one of the things that we did, but, but being someone who's young and working and trying to you know, start my career, um, it was hard to get to the Valley at 7 p.m. every, or one Thursday a month. And if I missed one, then it was two months. And if I had missed two, it was three months. And so one of the things that we've created, which I'm really proud of, is an online support group that's a video chat. Mm -hmm. And we have them in multiple time zones every other week. Um, and so people can sign on, so it's easy to connect. Um, and easy to talk to people. And I, was, uh, I participated in one of the groups last summer and met a guy who was 30, 30 years old or so. His mom had Alzheimer's. She had been sick for five years. He hadn't told a single person, not one person. The group that he joined was the first time he talked about it. He didn't tell one friend, no one. And he wasn't married, single. And that was just so sad to me to think that, that he'd been living with this secret, which it shouldn't even be a secret, but he felt that it was. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, connecting people, giving people a voice to share their story, which we do on our website. Um, you know, just sort of giving people a place to go to take action, to throw their own events. We have our college program. Right now, so they're mm -hmm. starting their programs in a lot of colleges. It's like 150 colleges now across mm -hmm. the country. We met earlier. Uh, there's about 50 people here at UCLA who are part of the youth movement against Alzheimer's. Uh, and I know I saw, yeah, a lot of uh, hands. Sounds really awesome. What, um, and what, what can these young people who are in graduate, graduate school, in business school, the best, the smartest in the country, what can they do to help you in your efforts? Well, specifically, um, if, if anyone wanted, we have a program which runs yearly called HFCU, um, in which we provide support for college students to throw their own Hilarity for Charity events. And it can be any type of fundraiser you can imagine. So um, It has to be funny. No, 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 no. Oh, no, it doesn't have to be a show. It can be anything. So um, University of Vermont has actually won the past two years. Um, and they, they sell cookies late night to different fraternities and dorm rooms. They do car washes. They, they, they picked up trash. Regular cookies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't ask those questions. Um, Whatever puts the money in the hopper. <laughs> Um, you know, they, they picked up trash, but these, so these, these students have come together and they form their own groups and, and we give them, you know, online fundraising tools. We give them, you know, graphics, letters to ask for donations, any, anything you would possibly need to throw your own event. Um, so to, that's, that's a big way you can get involved with us. Um, you can, if, if you've been personally touched by Alzheimer's, to me personally, I think one of the most important things you can do is share your story. The tendency is, is to sort of buy into the stigma of it and keep 
keep it inside like this man I met in this group. Um, and to tell a friend, send your story to us for us to put on our website. Um, one yeah. of the things, we, we've just done this big poll with WebMD, and it said that like 94% of Americans say they are now aware of what Alzheimer's is. Uh, four out of five said they actually have had a, a personal experience with someone who had Alzheimer's, but less than a third had a clue about what they could do, to your point. And so they don't ask questions of their doctors. 11% said they'd never ask their doctors, even though they're afraid of getting it. They have, they just feel completely hopeless and helpless, so they just want to deny that it's even there and not even like think about it. Is that the experience you have when you talk to people? And I think that that's wrong, because there is a lot of hope out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's the medical side of things, which is still, you know, pretty large question mark. There is nothing at this point that is curing or really treating this disease. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't take action on the advocacy side of things, which is what we really do at Hilarity for Charity. And so, like I said, it's about telling your friend, it's about going to a walk, it's about, you know, joining one of our events, it's about doing what you can do, um, which is what we do with Hilarity for Charity. Um, you know, you can be good at different things and you can create your own fundraisers. You can, you know, make it specific to you and then it becomes easy, it becomes fun. You get a group of friends together and say like, let's do, you know, a, a cooking thing where you bake things and sell them and donate money. I mean, it, it can be little, it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to start your own hilarity for charity. You can do you little things. You should try to go to this thing because it, it is really crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think there is a straight person like <laughs> of sound mind on the stage. <laughs> I mean, what did you like what do you go through to put that on, Seth? I mean, other Uh, I mean, it's you know, the I mean, we it's musicians are tough. We we like to have musicians and co comics. We have uh, uh you know, um, yeah, musicians sometimes are harder to pin down. Comedians, I, we know a lot of stand-up comedians. We had Miley Cyrus there this year. Bruno Mars performed the first year. Uh, I think he had some community service maybe he was working off. Um, <laughs> and so that's always something I look for is celebrities uh, getting arrested that I'm a big fan of. And so I think uh, of how I can exploit that for charitable purposes. Um, I'm praying Kanye gets arrested just to be great to have him. Um, <laughs> I think uh, we ask, uh, but honestly, the, the comics are generally, the first year there was a lot of confusion from the comedians as to why I was asking them to perform at an Alzheimer's related benefit, yeah. We didn't even mention Alzheimer's the first year at the event. The first year we had a hard time, we didn't, I mean, it just goes to show that there is a learning curve for it and even, we, we at first had a very hard time reconciling the comedic, tone and the fact that we were raising money for Alzheimer's and we weren't comfortable enough to say something like the PSA thing that yeah. you showed like that took a few years to kind of learn how to talk about you know and so yeah the first year we didn't even mention Alzheimer's all the money went to the thing and it was <laughs> called hilarity for charity but I actually don't think the word Alzheimer's was said at any moment at any point throughout the entire Show. Oh, I, re I remember right before it ended, I ran backstage and was like, you have to say something about Alzheimer's. Yeah, I was like, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, and and like, he said, was and, like, thank you for supporting Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. Like and even, like, it just, <laughs> it just seemed like a bummer. And so, um, and then we learned how to talk about it better and how to incorporate it more and, and how not to be afraid of it and how to kind of be tasteful with it and um, and not and to construct the night in such a way that it wouldn't kind of comedically destroy everything um, and and that yeah just it, it took us I think growing comfortable with it I think we kind of just did it the first year mm -hmm. thinking it would be like a show and then it kind of grew and grew and grew and so we realized like oh we're gonna have to learn how to talk about it we can't just avoid it we have to bring it up and 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 that actually is the whole point. So we kind of have to really get good at talking about it. And so there was for sure a learning curve. But um, the comedians are very they, they they're 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 very willing to help and they're excited to help. And you can tell it makes them feel a little guilty that they don't do more for charity in their day to day lives. Um, and musicians are tough though. They're crazy. But uh, 
But why do you, because so many people think, oh, you know, you're busy, everybody's busy, they're in graduate programs, people have careers. Why do you find that your work in this space, your philanthropy, is meaningful? Does, what does it bring to your lives as a couple and individually, professionally, personally? You know, it's interesting. I, I'm a writer and an actor, um, but, you know, my mom was diagnosed almost 10 years ago at this point, so it's been quite a journey. Um, and my, my parents moved out here to Los Angeles um, four, three and a half years ago. And, um, and that was sort of, I would say my mom was just sort of in that transition from being mobile, still talking a bit, to becoming less mobile, less verbal, less communicative. And while it was hard in the beginning because I think I was afraid of what was coming, suddenly what I was afraid of what was coming was was here. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I needed to sort of take a little, just break or sidebar, if you will, for my actual career to focus on this mm -hmm. because it helped me get to a place where I can where I can talk about it, where I can deal with it, where I can say this is my reality, this is what I'm doing about it. And and that has helped me so tremendously to find that balance because I, I, I don't think I could have done my other work because I needed to focus on this. And I'm so lucky that I had a partner to do it with who not only was supportive but also had a reach that I didn't have that allowed us to grow hilarity in the way that we have. So how important has it been for you, Seth? I mean, we were talking backstage about the importance of finding somebody if you want to make an impact in the world, that you find a partner who shares the same values, the same mission, and the same focus in your life. And how important has this shared mission been for you? Um. I mean, it's been really interesting. It, it's 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 for sure not what I expected to to ever be to doing or talking about ever. I, it's not something that when we started dating, I imagined would be something you know that like this would be something that would happen one day. Um, you don't think of it like that, but it ultimately, I think, has added a very uh, a much deeper level to our relationship. It's forced us to confront a lot of things in a lot of ways that we probably never would have confronted for years and, you know, if not for decades and decades and decades as far as just what what do we spend our time doing? Do we run from these things or do we confront these things? And, and do you try to fix these types of things, you know? And I think that it... You know, I think on a personal level, what's good is I've seen Lauren go from feeling very hopeless in the situation to feeling like she has some control over the some facet of the situation, at least, you know. And so anything I can do to help facilitate that is, you know, incredibly worthwhile and just on a personal level, very rewarding because my wife is not as unhappy, uh, which is good for many reasons. Um <laughs> So, but really, how lucky am I? I yeah. mean, really. <laughs> and as far as like being a famous person, like it is nice to like have something somewhat productive to talk about from time to time. Um, and and I honestly like never what what ultimately I am grateful for and grateful is a weird word because I do wish I didn't have to do any of it at all and I could just you know talk about the same stupid shit I've been talking about for the last decade, but. Um, <laughs> But the fact that this is in my life and it's part of our reality, you know, it, it has forced us to confront these things. And it's given me something, though, that I can talk about in a very organic, honest way. And it, and it helps people, which is a very nice thing, you know. The fact that, like, I don't have to do research before a thing like this. I don't have to learn statistics. I don't know the statistics. Honestly, I can just talk about like my personal experiences and my wife's personal experiences and my father-in-law's personal experiences and just what I've seen with my own two eyes. And just through doing that, people tell me they feel better and that it helps them and it makes them more comfortable with their experience and um, more willing to express themselves maybe. And so... That's something that I never necessarily thought I would have, was the ability to just talk about an element of my life then somehow that was therapeutic for people. And that's something that is good. Even though the reason for it sucks, it's good that 
that that has happened, you know? Do you find that people come up to you now about different things because you've been so out there with this issue? I mean, I know they come up to you about your films or about, you know, jokes and all that sort of stuff, but do they come up and talk to you in a way that is different for you? I would say, like, half the people that come up to me mention Alzheimer's um, wow. in some way. Yeah. And, like... And that is like six people a day. Like, uh, it, it, like, <laughs> like it, it's like a lot of people. It, it's shocking to me. Like, um, and wow. and it's, yeah. I mean, we have a grant program mm -hmm. where if you can't afford, you know, we just saw from our personal experiences, like in home care is the only thing that makes the situation like remotely livable, really. And so we have a grant program where if you're not a rich actor, you can apply to our grant program and we will pay to provide in-home care uh, wherever you live, basically. And I was flying... That uh, is huge. It's nice. That's huge. Yeah. And uh, where was We've I? given away, I should say, over 24,000 hours of care in a year. Yeah. That so. is so huge because it's so expensive. It's so expensive. And I was in Atlanta. New York. New York, it was in, I flew from Atlanta to New York, but, and on the plane was someone, a woman who had received one of our grants. Like, and, the, like two days before. Yeah. And she had, had almost canceled this trip because she couldn't leave her loved one. And I, I wasn't there, I'm just telling your story no, now. And it was, uh, again, it was unbelievable. And she came up to me and she, yeah, I mean, she, it was, it was as. What did she say? She said exactly that, that she couldn't go on the trip. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and that because of the grant, she could go on the trip to Atlanta or New York or wherever I was. And, uh, it was New York. It was New York. And um, it was cold. I remember that. Uh, but, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it was unbelievable. And, and again, the fact that, that you know, whatever coincidence caused that to happen was, was truly amazing. But it... it it really showed like the effect. It was like it was like a scene out of a movie. It was like now now's the scene I get to see the firsthand proof that we've helped people. Like it was fantastic. Like uh, it was really as gratifying as you would hope. And again, the re the like the subtext for it is very sad. And if I could if I could choose to not do it, I would probably just choose to have it all go away. And I would have never done any of this in the first place. But the fact that it's here and that you're able to have those experiences where someone is genuinely living their life differently because of you know something that you were able to do is, is very nice. I think what's also really great, a point you made, is that when you started, you didn't really know what you were doing, and it was very kind of mixed up, and you didn't know. And I think people always think, oh, I can't start because it has to be big, it has to be impactful, I have to raise, you know, I think the one I went to this year, you raised $2 million? 2.6, actually, but... 2.6 <laughs> million dollars, 2.6 million dollars. But when they started, it was small, and it kind of found its way. And so I think that's always something really important to remember, that when you want to start something, it doesn't have to be huge, and it can grow, and it can have impact over time, which is what has happened. And I think what was also interesting in this poll that we did, millennials said that because they're aware of Alzheimer's, because they know somebody, whether it's a grandparent or even a parent, that they consider themselves caregivers on deck. That they're aware that they may have to change their lives, move from a job. Does that surprise you? Uh, no, because it's the reality. I mean, I, I wish it wasn't, but uh, the numbers, I mean, they say that by 2050, there will be around 15 million people with Alzheimer's. So and that doesn't count what the impact with the families. Uh, well, exactly. So, if you, so then you think about the families of those people, how many people that is. Every single one of us will be directly affected by this disease, whether it's a best friend, a sister, a brother, a parent, a, a grandparent, an aunt and uncle, whatever it is. Those are some really scary numbers, especially when you consider the amount of care that is needed to take care of someone with this disease. And so I, I'm actually, I, I wish it wasn't the case, but I'm actually almost pleasantly surprised that at least millennials are thinking of themselves and realizing this is their destiny, and perhaps we can do something now to change that. Right, I thought, I thought that that was really interesting, but, and millennials are more aware of diet, of wellness. One of the things that the polls also said is that people were unaware that 
um, this disease disproportionately affects women, and that a woman in her early 60s is twice as likely to get Alzheimer's as she is to get breast cancer. And um, people were completely unaware that it disproportionately affected women, disproportionately affects African Americans and Latinos. They thought it was primarily a man's disease and that primarily something that happened to older people. But the amount of people who are being diagnosed in their 50s, their 40s, and you, you show that often at Hilarity for Charity. Yeah, I'm, we're making a documentary right now. They're here filming. Um, uh, called This Is Alzheimer's, and we focus on, on our family, um, a beautiful, wonderful facility that's here in the Valley, um, and a family in Michigan in which Ken Dodson was diagnosed at 30 years old with early onset Alzheimer's, which is, uh, it's, tragedy feels like a, such a small word, but, you know, but it's, it's their reality, and, and it, you know, is not the most common form of the disease, but it's out there, it exists, and, you know, that, that shouldn't be the case at all. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of n not being hopeless. As Seth talked about, well, there's nothing you can do. And even some of the doctors that were polled in the poll said, well, you know, we don't really know what we can do to kind of tell people what, you know, that would make them feel better, basically. And yet there is also a lot that can be money can go towards research, which, you know, there is so much going on when it comes to research. You can vote for people who make Alzheimer's and brain health a political issue because I think Seth talked about it being a real economic issue for this country. You can go into debt and be a comfortable middle-class uh, family or lower even upper-class family and go into debt and poverty within three months. If you have somebody, you talked about the expense of caregiving, so you can vote for people who talk about this as an issue. And what about kind of the, there's been a lot of, you know, I think interest now in food and the role that food is now playing when it comes to Alzheimer's. Uh, the road exercise plays when it comes to Alzheimer's, cardiovascular health directly connected to your brain health. So these are some of the things that I think are really hopeful. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing is like, you have to always think about like, it always goes back to what, what can you do? You know, right. there may not be a medical treatment at this point, but what you can do is nothing wrong with a little healthy diet and exercise, right? And to combat any disease, really. And there, and it seems like studies are showing there's all these great books out there. There's grain brain and, you know, how different foods are affecting our brains. Um, you know, those are the things that you seem to keep your mind active, you know, just to sort of, those are the things you can do. Um, until until there is a cure, and you know, but I think one of the biggest things you can do is what you just touched on, which is to talk about it, so that way the government steps up and there is more money, there is more research. Um, Alzheimer's is so severely underfunded when it comes to the other major diseases. Right. Um, all, like I, uh, I want to say, cancer gets five, six billion. Six billion. Right. HIV AIDS gets three billion, five, five billion, mm -hmm. and Alzheimer's gets just under a billion. Right, and that and seems a little off to me. Of that just got just it. happened in the fall. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that seems a little off to me when you look at the numbers. Um, and so the only way that the government is going to change that is by raising our voices. Is by they they will listen. We just have to put it out there. I mean, if you think about the advocacy towards those other larger diseases, it's happening. That's the reason why those numbers are so high. And so. I think what's interesting here is you were talking about kind of as a graduate program, business is now being viewed as a place that can solve the world's problems. And uh, I was saying that when I was growing up, politics was the place that people went if they wanted to change the world and they wanted to solve problems. Now you go, I guess, and no one shows up to hear you testify. Uh, but uh, I think that that's what's really interesting to me about speaking here is not only because you're focused on work on college campuses, but you're all in business school, you're getting graduate degrees, and how to use that degree and how to use your brain health and your brain uh, mentality to think about ways of curing diseases, to start companies that can change the way we live and eat and medicine. And that's what's so exciting about having Hilarity for Charity on a college campus and talking to business students. And we're also gonna have some questions now because some of the, we, what we try to do with all of these Architects of Change conversations is allow people to ask questions so that they're hopefully better educated when they leave, they're empowered, and most importantly, they get engaged. And uh, 
most importantly, you remember that this is coming to your doorstep and or it's coming to the doorstep of someone you love and how we can fight this together. So if anybody has any questions for Seth and Lauren about how you, go ahead. And there are microphones uh, here. Um, um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, uh, my question revolves around, and I feel okay to say this because I'm married into a world of doctors, one who actually ran the hospital here for 35 years and passed last year um, with signs of this. But I think, I wonder, the slip of the tongue at the beginning of the night when he said hilarity for clarity, I thought was quite fascinating because I think the frustration for my own mom with my father right now is for years she'd sit with the doctor and she would leave with the doctor saying everything's fine. Look at, you know, he's not answering you because don't you know men, they just sometimes don't want to listen to women. And they would say things that were just so depressing to her and never focusing on a clarity of the disease. And so I would love to think that you use your celebrity, you use your, as you called it, exploitation, and holding to task doctors to come up with some, uh, I don't even, a frame of reference, and I think why many people are not talking about it is the doctors don't let you leave calling your loved one having Alzheimer's. They let you leave knowing they have cancer or they've got heart disease or they've got, you know, whatever else it is. They never let you leave calling it Alzheimer's. And I think that's the first problem, and I wish, you know, every different doctor we've seen has a different scenario. And so maybe there could be a kind of a, an understanding of doctors in the community of America and let's you know, have Obama say, let's be the first country to come up with a cure for Alzheimer's, not just cancer. Um, I think would then get the people, the millennials, standing up, being able to walk out saying, yes, you know, my loved one has Alzheimer's or some form of dementia, they always say, um, and then we would actually fight the fight. I think uh, part of the issue with Alzheimer's is that you don't see people running around in remission. You don't see, like you see at all the breast cancer walks and you see great stories of I got cured and I was part of this trial and now I can stand up and tell you my incredible story of survival. So that is one of the challenges. But one of the things that also came out of this poll was the, the denial. And everybody that I've spoken to said, you know, that one of the, ones they, one of the things they wish they had done was gotten out of the denial faster and gotten their parents um, or their grandparents into a neurosurgeon, into a clinical trial where they can't be cured, but there's a lot of exciting things going on in clinical trials. Um, yeah, on a personal note, um, my heart goes out to you, Lauren. I lost my wife at 59 to this disease. And I, I live out in Riverside. I drove all the way out here just to I don't know, what, what I would love to see, I'm doing all I can in my city to advocate. We've become dementia friendly. And people say, you know, how do you take care of that elephant in the room? You take care of it one bite at a time. But to be honest with you, I'm tired of chewing right now. I mean, I really think you guys have turned the heat up underneath the elephant to a point. And I, I'm gonna use this opportunity since we're at a school of business, because I. I have tons of ideas on what to do. I say we start a national collegiate challenge among marketing schools to come up with an advertising campaign for Alzheimer's disease. Basically, these students have projects that are due. They have a budget of, let's say, a fictitious $3 million or whatever. And they're doing projects on how to promote widgets and et cetera. Let's see if a collegiate or a college across this nation can come up with an idea to sell something that people just don't want to talk about, which is Alzheimer's disease. And if you can wrap you know, the support for this and get it going, I think it might be a step in creating that deep fryer we need to put that elephant in. And it's going to be a lot easier to chew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a really great idea, honestly. Um, uh, yeah, I really do. I mean, I think as we grow as an organization, I think, I mean, I was just saying that I was going to tap these students for many ideas as they were offered up to us. Um, and I think, I mean, marketing is actually uh, something that we hadn't thought about. because, And that actually is a very good approach. They're good at selling things to people. And, and I think... Um, <laughs> 
And I think this is a sales job partially because because people don't want to buy it. So um, I think that's a brilliant idea, and we'll for sure talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm very short for the mic. Um, I had a question more about um, your organization and the process that you've gone through to let it come to fruition. So millennials are really good about talking about things, but sometimes it's really hard to get millennials to act um, on some sort of issue that they're passionate about. And I wanted to ask you guys how, in your experience, you've gotten millennials to go from that idea to action. Incentive. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's what hard. kind of incentive, Seth? Well, our our college program, the the the, the reward is to meet Seth. So <laughs> I, I realize I realize that's it's what all we have all of you now. <laughs> It's our only resource. None, none uh, of you will be motivated to do that. I know longer, exactly. But, Blew it with this room, yeah, but. Um, but yeah, yeah you auction off cooking with Seth, eating yeah. with Seth, yeah. playing video games with Spend Seth. Spend a whole month. You might be a connection own. to any other celebrity we can use. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're running out of ideas with me. Uh, <laughs> He's a video game master. Yeah, you can exactly. Play the longest day with Seth. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's it's really hard, honestly, and and it, and that is exactly part of the issue and and um you know how do you get people to do something um it's if you have any ideas let me know because uh, it, it is you know with our with our event we've literally had to make it as desirable an event as humanly possible to get literally the best comedians and musicians on the planet and that's the only way we can make people listen to us talk about alzheimer's for 45 seconds and so you know, it's really hard. And with these college students, I'm literally like flying to Vermont to like hang out with these people. <laughs> like we've done like, it twice. I've done it twice. That's what it takes. Like <laughs> it, it, it's it's really not easy to get them to do stuff. You know. Um, <laughs> What and is that so, like? What do you do when you go to Vermont and hang out with college students? I literally, we showed Super Bad, and me and Christmas Floss gave a live audio commentary to the whole movie, <laughs> like <laughs> for like for like sixty kids, like. And then every single one of them took a photo. With yeah, them. and then we hung out. Chris got drunk with them. Like it was like. <laughs> Like we're really trying, you know. <laughs> so. But I think I tell them I, that if they uh, if they donate a certain amount, they get to shave your beard. Yeah, exactly. That would be a good but, one. But she would I have like to that. Say, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would do that. That's actually but, um, very clever. A lot of commentary to super bad. I'd pay for that. It was yeah. funny. Yeah. It was good, but it, it's really hard. I'll yeah. say this though: it's about like one small step at a time. Like you know, we didn't. When we started Hilarity Fraternity, wasn't an organization; it was an event that we could do. We were like, we can do this event, and then it grew from there very slowly, very organically. And so, you know, but you don't know what's going to take off. And I'll use the ice bucket challenge as such a crazy thing that happened that raised so much money for ALS. And I don't know if people necessarily have learned anything about ALS from it. But boy, did it get a lot of attention. But they didn't know that the first time someone dumped a bucket of ice water over their head. It just sort of happened. And so it's about throwing anything against the wall because you don't know that your little thing could be the next ice bucket challenge. That's the thing about social media these days. And so it's trying anything because something will take off. It will. I think probably n nobody thought that kind of comedians or doing a night of comedy around Alzheimer's was was a good idea. <laughs> I don't think a I don't think a comedy night with Alzheimer's anyone would have thought that was a good idea. Yeah, right. I right. had people specifically try to talk us out of it. Actually, uh, <laughs> what did they say? What did they say? <laughs> they were just like, I don't know if that'll work. Like, I mean, there it just seemed like exactly the conflict you would expect. I mean, yeah, I think some of the comedians even were like, okay, I guess we'll try it. But um, but I think honestly, I don't. I think with our college program, it's a good example. Like, I don't expect these kids to raise enough money to find the cure for Alzheimer's because they're not going to raise seven billion dollars. So, every year. every year. So, like, I think what the hope more is that they see us, people who had a problem, who had their whatever skill set and resources they had, and found a way to use their skills and resources and their passions and what they did to express themselves and apply that to solving the problem that they had in their lives. And to me, if there's like 
one hope for this is that like some college student who actually is smart and maybe can find a way to make $7 billion a year, he'll see what we're doing and think like, oh, I can do that. I can take my passions and apply them to solving the problems that are going on. And I think that is like the most likely thing that will happen out of this, unless somehow Vermont raises $7 billion this year. <laughs> But I think that's also important to note that you actually really work at this and you're traveling to campuses to have dinner, to, uh, you know, watch movies. You're like schlepping out there. And so, like, it's not like, you know, just because I think sometimes people think, oh, well, you guys are famous. It's easy for you to do. It's not a problem. No, but that's what people think a lot of the time. Like, oh, well, you can just do it. It's not that much work for you. But it's really like you're out there kind of on the front lines and nothing yes. is beneath you. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll hang out with anyone. But <laughs> but again, I think, but it's not, but what is good about it is that it isn't, again, the actual things we're doing are the exact things we would be doing anyway. Like to do an audio commentary super bad with Christmas Plus, like to me, that's a fun way to spend an afternoon. And so the fact that that can be, an incentive for a group of kids to raise thousands of dollars like that is like perfect to me. Like I'm doing what I would want to do anyway. And they're being inspired to do things that help humanity. And all that kind of comes together in a nice little afternoon in Vermont. And so <laughs> like, you know, to me that it, 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 we are slipping around there, but I slip, I slip all around the world to sell my bullshit movies. So I should be more than happy to slip to Vermont to inspire some kids to help humanity. So it's really not that bad, you know, uh, in that regard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we have time for like two more questions. Okay, hi, my name is Esmeralda Vasquez, and um, I was. I understand that the we're slowly like rising up from the stigma of even saying Alzheimer's at the event. Um, I was wondering if it would help at all to talk about the gross or like uncomfortable things that um, our family members do or friends or anyone that we know um, to help advocate and bring awareness because there's a lot of stories that I heard because um, my great grandma has Alzheimer's and she's been jumping around from each house within the family and I've been talking with the like my cousins and they've like told me some really like gross like uncomfortable disgusting things so I was wondering if like if we bring out those stories would that help in advocating for this disease I, yes absolutely I mean I, I I think people are so in the dark about about the disease about the reality of it um you know one issue that I often have with how it's portrayed in a lot of movies and tv is that it's not real. It is that version that Seth, you know, described in his talk, which is that if someone can't find their keys or they have mismatched shoes, and that's maybe early on part of a little symptom of it, but that's not the reality. That's not the reality that we face with my mom and have faced with her. Um, and so, you know, we try to do that on our website. We encourage anyone who has any sort of experience with the disease to share their story, and we put it out there. And because that's, you know, once people realize the reality of this thing, people want to do something about it. They, they do take action. You know, we've shown little bits and pieces of our documentary to people, and the response is, I had no idea. I had no idea it looked like this. And so it's about sharing those stories, and then more people will be like, well, I had no idea. What can I do? How do I help? I have to do something. Okay, okay final question back there. Hi, my name's Patrick, and this is a comment for you and also the gentleman that drove up from uh, Riverside for this. Uh, and I, I definitely agree with you, the, uh, a lot of innovation and uh, the future of just humanity, I think, is going to come off of college campuses. And I want you to know that even here at UCLA Anderson, uh, we have a startup company that is working towards Alzheimer's cures and uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we've done the research and found that the majority of drugs fail during clinical trials, and that is because uh, the preclinical trials they don't have the full 3D structure that can be built of neurons, and they can't keep those alive for prolonged periods of time. And within our minds, our neurons are all in, in three dimensions, yet we're testing in two dimensions, and, and that's why many are failing preclinical. Uh, so we're working and, and have already created patents and gotten VCs. We have actually a lab up in, uh, up in the Silicon Valley right now, um, but we're based out of UCLA. And, and we're working towards solving things uh, that you've had to deal with personally, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, definitely including Alzheimer's here on campus. Great. Wow, bravo, That's bravo. Fantastic, yeah. Keep it up.
Okay, well, we'll do one more question and then. Um, I'm a part of the nonprofit organization, the Youth Movement Against Alzheimer's at UCLA. Um, yeah, we're all here. Um, I like love what you guys were saying about the stigma that surrounds mental health and that we have to remove this stigma and everything like that. Um, I wanted to ask, what would you say you're the most rewarding part of the whole hilarity for charity process was for you guys? Uh, for me, uh, for me, I've, uh, for, I've uh, sounds obnoxious. I feel endlessly rewarded, honestly. Like getting to do something like this is amazing. I, I feel so. It feels weird to say it, but I feel so lucky that I've gotten to get to this other side of my journey and meeting people who are appreciative of what we do. Getting to help people is a true privilege. I mean, giving away the the at-home care and rewarding those people, getting thank you notes from people saying that they've now joined humanity again after years of being trapped in a bedroom with their loved one. That's, I never in my life thought I would be so lucky to get to touch people that way. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, uh, the fact that I, yeah, can help people and uh, in any way make anyone lives uh, lives better um is again you know something that you know as a comedian in an abstract way you're like you know i make people happier it's great it helps the world but like to have someone in an airport be like no you like made my day-to-day -day life better with your uh charity is amazingly rewarding but honestly the fact hearing my wife be able to talk about it and feel in control of it to me is the most gratifying thing because in my day-to-day -day life that is what has you know i mean and and it's like i don't know if you should clap it's kind of the most selfish reason i could be doing this honestly <laughs> like it just makes my day-to-day -day life better that my wife is much happier you know and 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 i mean that in every sense though in um, every sense of that and and the fact that if, if I can help add, help that happen in any way, that is incredibly rewarding. Uh, anytime I'm not making her miserable is great. So <laughs> remember that happy wife, happy life. <laughs> remember that. Well, I think it's. I want to thank Lauren and Seth uh, for all of their work for coming here tonight. Um, they, uh, I. Uh, I have seen them on the front lines of fighting this disease for a long time. They really are having an impact. They're affecting people's lives day in, day out. And I hope if they leave anything with you tonight other than happy wife, happy life, that, uh, that you can start small, that you can have an impact. Uh, you don't have to be you know, a movie star uh, to uh, make a difference in the world. And that there's so many people who are actually out there doing that who can use your help. And their organization is really great. And their event is hilarious, if you can go to it. I don't know, it's, when is it this year? October 15th. You can find out more about Hilarity for Charity. You can find out if you're interested in the statistics, the WebMD poll, Shriver Report Snapshot goes up tomorrow. It's got some really interesting facts and figures. So if you're actually in the organizations and interested in this fight, in this disease, you can go to WebMD and see the most up-to-date statistics. and. I've written a big editorial that's going to run tomorrow about getting us out of the state of our denial, fighting this disease, supporting people who are on the front lines, caregiving. It's great love in action. And uh, if you can meet somebody who's doing caregiving and see what they're doing and support them in any way, it's well worth your while. So thank you all for coming tonight, and God bless.